Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. And today we have got an unpopular notes video. And this is normal looking videos with disturbing backstories. We're going to get right into it. As I film this, we are just three subscribers away from 1K. Can we get there? You all going to have to let me know. Because you all got to press subscribe button. But again, this is normal looking videos with disturbing backstories. Let's go. This clip of Idi Amin, the former Ugandan head of state, laughing on a boat has become a popular meme. However, the true context behind this clip is deeply unsettling, especially when considering the horrific acts committed by Amin during his rule. In 1974, this dictator was featured in a documentary where he was questioned about a past remark relating to the Holocaust. Rather than responding directly, Amin erupted into a chilling, maniacal laughter. This laughter takes on a sinister tone when you learn about the atrocities he committed while in power. <laughs> Idi Amin's reign in Uganda from 1971 to 1979 was marked by widespread terror. He was responsible for the brutal torture and killing of up to 500,000 people. His regime oh, targeted specific ethnic groups, political- 500,000 people? He's- well I'm gonna assume he didn't single-handedly torture 500,000 people. He was just in power and caused that amount of damage to be done, but that is- Still fucking insane. 500,000 people being tortured by this guy. Pure fucking evil. Political opponents and anyone he perceived as a threat. Amin's methods were barbaric. Victims were often tortured, their bodies mutilated, and some were forced to kill their own family members. Reports from that era describe how Amin's soldiers carried out mass executions, sometimes dumping bodies into the Nile River. Prisons under Amin were places of extreme torture and suffering. There were also accounts of Amin personally participating in some of the killings. Not surprisingly, Amin's rule was characterized by rampant human rights abuses. His regime plunged the country into economic chaos and left a legacy of fear and trauma. For those who didn't know the story, it was a classic meme to send your friends. For those who know, it's a stark reminder of the cruelty and inhumanity that marked his dictatorship. Oh. <laughs> In November of 2011, a tragic event unfolded at the Quakers Hill Nursing Home in Sydney, Australia. The facility was devastated by fire. The press swarmed the scene as the fire services battled the inferno, reporting on the tragedy and interviewing those involved. Among them was Roger Dean, a nurse at the nursing home. Dean spoke to the media, claiming- So I'm gonna assume the reason why this is disturbing is because he set the fire. He had to try to rescue people from the blazing building. I'm, I'm Roger, I'm one of the nurses and just there was a, a fire and I just quickly just did what I can to get everyone out. However, he left out a crucial and shocking detail. He was the one who had started the fire. I assume so. I said that'd be the reason he'd probably be on here is that he set the fire. Don't know the reason you have a set of fire with nurse. No, what the hell they want old people do to you? They saw your hair looking and said you look kind of weird and they were, you, you just got so upset. Your ego got so maniacally checked that you had to just start a fire in anger. The truth behind this horrific act was even more disturbing. Dean had stolen painkillers from the nursing home and, in a desperate attempt to conceal his theft, he set the building ablaze. That's... Wait, you set the place ablaze just to hide that you had stolen pink? What? <laughs> the fire that Dean ignited rapidly destroyed the nursing home, claiming the lives of elderly residents. Eventually, the grim reality of Dean's actions came to light. He was arrested and faced justice for his unthinkable crime. Good. It was like Satan saying to me that it's the right thing. In court, Dean admitted his guilt, pleading guilty to 11 counts of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Good. Let him rot in jail. A pool party for Russian Instagram influencer. Oh. This one, this one's a mixed one for me because I understand it. I don't know why all the hate goes on her. Still, because but everything I've heard is that her boyfriend set this up, but for some reason she gets the hate. I've never understood why. 
how that works. I know the boyfriend was one of the people who died. So you don't really want to hate on it. But just because he, she, he died doesn't mean some reason she gets blamed. But maybe it's because I'm missing something. I don't know something. But I've just I, that's always been the thing that confuses me. Is why she gets all the hate when he's the one that planned it. At least by the stories I've heard. That's what I've heard. Yekaterina Didenko turned into a nightmare, marking her 29th birthday with a horrific tragedy. The event occurred at a pool complex where someone decided to add blocks of dry ice to the water, aiming to cool it down and create a visually striking effect. This moment was captured on video and shared on social media, showing guests excitedly jumping into the misty steam-covered pool. However, the use of dry ice, essentially frozen carbon dioxide, had unforeseen and deadly consequences. As the dry ice sublimated, it released a large amount of carbon dioxide gas, quickly saturating the air around the pool. This sudden increase in carbon dioxide levels in the air led to a rapid decrease in oxygen, creating a highly dangerous environment for the people inside. The lack of oxygen caused severe breathing problems among the guests. Many started to choke and struggle for air, with some losing consciousness due to the asphyxiating conditions. Amid the chaos and confusion, three people tragically lost their lives. Among the victims was Dedenko's own husband, Valentin, who was there to celebrate with her. What began as a festive occasion ended in a devastating loss, leaving a lasting impact on the lives of those involved and their loved ones. The YouTube channel Boots Made for Crushing started with a simple, if odd, idea. Videos of boots crushing different objects. At first it was just things like cans or toys, and people watched these videos for a bit of strange entertainment. But then, things took a dark turn. The original channel had a link to Tumblr, where Boots kept his secret content. The content was unlisted and only available to those with the link, and you can see why. The channel had videos where they crushed living animals instead of inanimate objects. The shocking change upset a lot of people. Animal lovers and many others were horrified and angry. People started to complain and report the channel. This wasn't just a bad choice for content, it was against the law. Eventually, however, said law caught up with the person running boots made for crushing. The channel got shut down and the person faced severe consequences for their actions. Good. Yeah, I may not like animals being hurt. Not at all. In July of 2016, the internet buzzed with a mystery surrounding popular There's no disturbing backstory with this video. This is a video that just is a normal video that people made disturbing because they put their theories into it. There was nothing wrong in this video. Y'all lost it. YouTuber Marina Joyce. Known for her emo style and makeup tutorials, Joyce uploaded a video that struck many as odd. The video was supposed to be a simple ad for her fashion brand, but viewers noticed something unsettling about Joyce's behavior. She seemed unnatural, kept glancing away from the camera, and at one point it looked like someone was directing her off-camera. This is the clothing company that I'm advertising, and this is the dress that I'm wearing. Some fans even thought they heard her whisper, help me. I have never heard people str- I feel like this is what happened is Some people in your videos And this is the- Some people in the videos are just off You just have an off day You film your video, you need to do thing You need- you're just off for some reason And you kinda come across off in a video It just happens I think that's what happened to her She just had an off type of day And so her eyes kinda were off Maybe 
like, you know, she has a script she has to read because she's of a fashion brand, has to get certain stuff across, because that's what you do when you have an ad, a, a brand you're trying to get across, and sponsor your own, you want to make sure you get every little detail of it. So she tried to do that, probably had to be script, get someone to help, you know, someone maybe keep the stand in place, probably there's always been someone helping her, just no one brings it up if she's like out and about. So, the problem more, the problem not much to this, and then I don't know who on earth your stupid ass has heard the word whisper, heard her whis whisper help me, there's nothing that she says, it's literally nothing, y'all are hearing things, y'all create danger and heard things that weren't even there, maybe all the ones in trouble. This led to wild speculation and conspiracy theories. People started analyzing the video looking for clues. The most bizarre theory suggested that she'd been kidnapped by ISIS. This hashtag, hashtag save Marina Joyce, went viral and the story blew up. Then things got even stranger. Joyce invited fans to an event in London which fueled the kidnapping theories even more. Some believed it was a trap set by ISIS. The police checked on her and confirmed. This is insane! Okay, even let's go with your thing. Why? Why Marina Joyce? What exactly was the- Why Marina Joyce, if you were gonna kidnap anyone, your ISIS, why would you- Why is Marina Joyce who you choose? I don't even think she was the biggest YouTuber at that time. I could be wrong. I don't keep track of that shit. I don't think she was the biggest YouTuber at that time. Well, if you were gonna do a YouTuber, you would do the biggest one, wouldn't you? That's like an actual person? Maybe that was Marina Joyce. I don't know. But, like... What exactly do they hope? Why, why Marina Joyce? I, I wouldn't. I, I feel like that's about. That is that was that she was dumb. safe with the room. That's a dumb theory. I feel like people just couldn't. They're like, she was kidnapped by who? Uh, um, 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 ISIS. There you go. Got it. Rumors didn't stop. During this madness, Joyce's YouTube channel saw a huge spike in views, around 50 million across your videos. Big YouTubers jumped on the story, discussing every detail, but Joyce didn't say much about it at the time. The mystery eventually faded, but in 2019, Joyce was in the headlines again when she disappeared for 10 days. She was found safe, but with no clear explanation. Finally, in December of 2022, Joyce opened up in a video. She explained that she hadn't gone missing, her parents were just worried about her. She admitted that her odd behavior in 2016 was due to partying and going down a, quote, dark path. She also talked about exploring spiritual concepts, dealing with mental health issues, and a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, which she claimed was cured by the Harry Karishna movement in cannabis. She assured her fans that she was now much happier. Important disclaimer, guys. There's no known cure for MS. Treatments like cannabis can help with symptoms. Marina Joyce's story is a reminder of how quickly internet speculation can spiral out of control and how little we often know about the personal struggles of public figures. That's the thing that's insane, right? It's like she's got a mental health she got mental health problems. But the problem is now because any little thing she does it's just gonna cause people to now just assume things. Because this theory, I bet you still hasn't ended. She tells you all these things. And there are still going to be people, dumb people, who believe that theory still. And will not let that theory, there was no, if ISIS could end it, and they'd still believe the theory. There was no, for some reason there are people who are just going to accept in their mind that Marina Joyce is kidnapped. I am hoping none of them are weird enough people that they will run and try to be the savior. But yeah, fuck insanity. In 2003, a terrible fire broke out at the station nightclub in Rhode Island during a rock concert. What makes this tragedy stand out is a video that captures the whole thing. A local TV station cameraman was there to report on safety in nightclubs. Ironically, he ended up filming the fire from the start. The video shows the band Great White beginning their show, then suddenly the stage's fireworks set the club's walls on fire. The flames spread super fast and you can see the smoke and fire taking over the room. The video is scary because it's so real. You can see people getting scared and trying to rush out, but the main door got jammed with the crowd, trapping many inside.
story is insane, but we've heard about the tab, so I'm not super surprised. <laughs> This is the story. What makes this uh, the whole thing is, is this how many different ways this could not have been as tragic as it is, but for some reason, everyone made it fucking tragic. Like, there were multiple different things that were done by people. Like, the doors weren't allowed. Uh, there were other, the other besides the front door, a bunch of the other doors weren't allowed to be used to escape the fucking fire, which is ridiculous. I, it, fucking stupid. <laughs> It's a hard video to watch because it shows just how quickly everything turned into chaos and how dangerous the fire was. Station Nightclub Fire became one of the saddest and deadliest nightclub fires in US history, taking 100 lives and injuring over 200 people. This video wasn't just a recording of a sad event, it became very important afterward. It was used to figure out what went wrong and to show how important it is to have good safety rules in places like nightclubs. Because of what happened to the station nightclub and what was seen in the video, laws and safety standards for nightclubs got a lot better all over the country. Time I'm pretty sure if I'm correct too, did people get charged? I'm pretty sure the owners of the bar and shit got charged. Tommy Cooper was a beloved British comedian and magician known for his distinctive fez and unique blend of comedy and magic. Cooper was performing on the variety show live from Her Majesty's broadcast live on ITV. In the middle of his act, Cooper suddenly collapsed. The audience, used to his slapstick style, initially thought it was a joke, part of his quirky and unpredictable humor. Laughter filled the theater as people expected him to get back up and continue with his act. But this time, it wasn't part of the show. Cooper had suffered a massive heart attack on stage. The realization that this was not a joke slowly dawned on the audience and the crew. As the gravity of the situation became clear, the show's producers quickly cut to a commercial break and medical assistance was called. Unfortunately, Cooper was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. The fact that Cooper died on live TV made his passing even more shocking and surreal. It was a bizarre, almost unbelievable end for a man who'd spent his career fooling and amusing his audience. His death on stage in front of a live audience remains one of the most unusual and tragic moments in the history of live TV performances. It's almost a little... I don't want to say poetic, but kind of... Like it was meant to happen, you know, a man, he's so awful TV, entertained me for years and years and years, so, too much that his life ended, live on stage in front of the audience. I feel like probably in his mind he would rather end it any other way. Trey Eric Sesler's story is a chilling- Big man evil as fuck. This guy's pure just evil. This guy's lost his mind, had lost his mind and is just pure evil. And tragic case that shocked the community. Sessler was a popular YouTuber known as Mr. Anime who posted reviews and discussions about, well, you guessed it. However, his final video and the following events revealed a much darker reality. Well, hi everybody, it's Mr. Anime here. This is just an update video to let you guys know that, uh, I'm going to reward myself with a, probably a two or three week break coming up here from YouTube videos, uh, anime reviews in particular. I might do some blog stuff, um, 
I want to thank you guys a lot for sticking with me and watching the channel. Uh, I'll probably be putting out some blog videos, like I said. And I hope you enjoy those blog videos. I hope you definitely enjoy those. For years, Sessler had been secretly planning a horrendous act. He intended to attack his local high school. He fantasized about taking the lives of 70 students. This plan was something he detailed and contemplated over a long period, but in a twisted turn of events, he never carried it out. Instead, in a horrific act of violence, Sessler killed his parents, his brother, and even their family pets. His reasoning for this was as disturbing as the act itself. He claimed he wanted to spare them the pain of knowing he was a school shooter. This misguided attempt to protect his family from future shame and guilt led to an ungraspable tragedy. After committing these murders, Sessler experienced a moment of realization. He described the act of killing as feeling too real, a stark confrontation with the gravity and brutality of his actions. This moment of clarity, however horrific and late, led him to abandon his plans for the school shooting. Sessler turned himself in to the authorities and was subsequently sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, a sentence he requested himself. He believed that he would always be a threat to the public and never wanted the chance to be released. The video titled 13 was published on the Lisa Home channel. It was merely 10 seconds long and showed a countdown. The video didn't raise any immediate alarms, but it gained significance after a month when Lisa Holm, a 17-year-old Swedish teenager, mysteriously vanished, casting a shadow over what was initially an unremarkable piece of content. Lisa Holm was last seen in June after finishing her shift at a cafe in Bloomberg near Lidköping in western Sweden. Her disappearance triggered one of Sweden's largest missing person searches, capturing the nation's attention and concern. The community rallied together hoping for Lisa's safe return, but the story soon took a grim turn for the worse. The search ended in heartbreak when Lisa was found dead. The circumstances of her discovery were disturbing. She was partially naked, her mouth had been taped shut, and there were no signs of sexual assault. This chilling discovery intensified the mystery around her disappearance and death. The investigation led to the arrest of Nerujas Bilovikis, a 35-year-old Lithuanian man living in Bloomberg. He was eventually found guilty of murdering Lisa Holm. Forensic evidence played a crucial role in the conversation. Bilovikis' blood was found on Lisa's coat and on a piece of rope at the crime scene, and traces of his semen were discovered in the barn where Lisa was killed. Despite Bilovikis' denial of any involvement in the crime, the overwhelming evidence against him led to a life sentence. However, in Sweden, it's common for life sentences to be reduced after a number of years. Following any reduction in his sentence, Bilovikis is expected to be deported from the country. The court concluded that Lisa was murdered on June 7th in a barn in Blomberg, and then her body moved a few kilometers away. The forensic examination indicated that she was killed through strangulation and hanging. Bilovikis' defense attorney, Inga Ronbeck, mentioned that her client maintained his innocence and was considering an appeal. Was the video made by her killer, or was it an almost impossible coincidence? It remains a dark mystery. Yeah, because at the moment, like, can they confirm that was her? Or her channel, even? Because at the moment, who the heck made it? Like, was this even coincidentally like, delayed to her? In May of 2015, a shocking story emerged from Michigan involving 46-year-old Martin Durham and his wife, Glenna. The couple was found in their home with gunshot wounds. Martin didn't survive and Glenna was seriously hurt. At first it looked like they were both victims of an attack, but the truth turned out to be much darker, and it was revealed by a parrot. What? Martin's parrot, Bud, started repeating what seemed to be Martin's last words after the incident. The series repetition captured on video hinted at a grim scenario. The police investigation found that Glenna and Martin had an argument that tragically ended with Glenna shooting Martin and then trying to take her own life. Bud the parrot's ability to mimic these final moments became key evidence. Look, I don't want to say that's obvious, but listen, if I'm, I, I, if I'm a lord, I feel like that's not exactly strong material. I think you need more than just the parrot.
The bird's repeated phrase is painted a pic- It's saying that the set she was found by a parrot. She probably thought she found a crime, they believed her and everything, and then they were sitting there like, Hey, why is this parrot saying these things? She was just like, the in, in her head, she was like, the parrot got rid of, threw me under the bus? Damn. Oh, I'd hate to be that be the way I go. Picture the events that led to Martin's death, contributing to the case against Glenna. In a strange twist of fate, a pet parrot became a witness in a murder case, helping to reveal the truth behind a tragic family incident. What? This tragic story revolves around an episode of The Jenny Jones Show. Oh, I know this one. A popular talk show known for its often provocative and sensational topics. In 1995, Scott Amander was invited to participate in an episode of the show, which was themed around secret crushes. Amander, who was openly gay, revealed on the show that he'd had a crush on his friend Jonathan Schmitz. Schmitz, who was not openly gay, appeared surprised on the show, and the episode was filled with the typical talk show theatrics that aimed to maximize audience reaction. Watch it now to meet Donna and Scott. Now, Donna has been helping Scott pursue his secret crush on John. John. What is Scott that has the crush on you? You lied to me. Did you have any idea that he liked you this much? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> no <laughs> Can you tell us not. what your status is? I mean, are you involved with anybody or? Um, no, but I am uh, definitely a heterosexual, I guess you could say. <laughs> the episode was never aired, but the events that transpired afterward were shocking. On the morning of March 9th, Amadur left a sexually suggestive note on Schmidt's apartment doorstep. In response, Schmitz purchased a 12-gauge shotgun, confronted Amador at his home, and fired two shots into Amador's chest. Schmitz called 911 to report- I'm gonna be honest, right? Probably shouldn't have done- e either of those things should not have been done. Man should not have a 12-gauge shotgun and killed to take the person's life. Far worse than what the other guy did, okay? But the other guy probably should- not have done the note especially if this was after the show day where he literally said he was straight i don't with the killing and he was subsequently arrested man my sister has a good just got a man okay calm down okay <laughs> okay why did you do that schmitz was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to prison he's gay but I'm not he said he wouldn't leave me alone that's why I did it he said I went on the Jenny Jones show I didn't know it was a guy that's why I killed him Jenny Jones show ambushed this defendant with humiliation and in retaliation this defendant ambushed the victim with a shotgun Additionally, the case led to a legal battle against the producers of The Jenny Jones Show. Amador's family sued the show for negligence, arguing that they'd irresponsibly provoked and ambushed Schmitz for the sake of entertainment without considering the potential consequences. I have a feeling that lawsuit didn't go far, because I don't think they have a gripe, because in no way could they have known, in no way does any, would anyone, even if they had let him know, there's no way they would have known he would have grabbed, bought a shotgun, and shot the person. Because that is not how you deal with those situations. This is a renegade business. These are irresponsible people. These are people beholden, answerable to no one. As much as we all regret what happened, the fact is that this tragedy is about the actions of one individual. You used him as a source of entertainment, having no idea what his emotions would be for other people. Didn't you? No, that's not the way I see it. Well, I don't use people on the show. The current initially awarded the amateur family substantial damages, but this decision was later overturned on appeal. I'm not surprised that it got overturned. I'm not surprised. Ronnie Okala is a name that stands out. Oh, it's time for the definition of evil right here. The guy that's on every TV show, the guy that's on every damn day, that's every damn, every time they talk about a TV show, uh, Kills on TV show, they talk about live TV, they have to talk about uh, no, these type of videos. It's always him on there. He's pure fucking evil. It's out in America's true crime stories. In 1978, Alcala appeared on the TV show The Dating Game and surprisingly won a date with a woman named Cheryl Bradshaw using his charm and somewhat bizarre humor. But Cheryl felt something was off about him and called him creepy, deciding not to go out with him. 
another contestant on the show also said Alcala was a bizarre guy. And welcome to the dating game, and here they are. The bachelor number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Here is a young lady with a wealth of experience. She once earned a living massaging feet. Welcome, if you will, sensational Cheryl Bradshaw. And we're going to start by having them say hello to you and see how they sound. Number one, would you say hello to Cheryl, please? We're going to have a great time together, Cheryl. Bachelor number one. Yes? What's your best time? The best time is at night. Night time. Why do you say that? Because that's the only time there is. Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one. That's your number one. All right. Rodney, come on, say hello. Congratulations. I will say thank God in the end she did not go on this date because she probably that's why she's allowed to she lived to tell the tale. What's really shocking is that Alcala turned out to be a serial killer who did horrible things to his victims, including assaulting and murdering them. He'd already murdered several people before he was on the TV show, and he didn't stop there. He continued to commit more murders afterwards. At least eight people fell victim to his crimes, but some believe he could have hurt as many as 130 people. His crime spree finally ended when he was caught and sent to prison for life. He died in 2021 in a California state prison. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, subscribe button. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all for the next one.